But I, I, I don't tell this story much. Um, I don't know why, I just don't. But I'm going to tell it now. When the Lord, when I went to Guatemala on one of the missionary journeys I went on, seems like today we're talking about being in other countries, huh? But I was on a missionary journey to Guatemala. I say missionary because I, uh, because we were we were doing missions, but I wasn't really a missionary. This was a short-term thing. And after the earthquake uh, de devastated Guatemala in 1976, there were a million people homeless. One million out of seven million were homeless. In 30 seconds, one million out of seven million were homeless. 30,000 were killed in 30 seconds. It was complete and total devastation. I was actually there when it happened. Then I started going back on these short-term missions trips to, uh, we would take a, just a, you know, minimal supplies, truck in minimal supplies to these villages and build a little one-room shanties really i mean four walls and a, and a roof no no plumbing no electricity dirt floors this was just a way to get them out of the weather and a roof over their heads they still had to go to the creek and get water they had to figure out a way to create you know sanitation and facilities and outhouses but but at least they were out of the weather and then we would we would build those through the day and then in the, at night, we would hook up a generator, uh, hook up a PA system to a generator. We'd put a little folding table up in the middle of the village, and somebody would sing a few songs, have a guitar, and then one of us would get up with a microphone through that small PA system, and we'd preach the gospel. We said, this is why we're here doing this for you. Jesus sent us. And it was a... Well, you can imagine it was an incredible evangelism tool. I mean, when you go build a house for somebody and you pay for all the materials and you do all the work and you just bring them the love of Jesus and they get their baby out of the rain, they're ready to listen to what you have to say. But we, <clears throat> on one of these journeys, we went to a village called Apollo Montanado, means the village of sticks. It was so far out, it took us two hours to get there in these little van, bus type vehicles. And when we get to the, off to the point where the village was down below, down the mountain, uh, we, we had to get off on this uh, dirt road and wind our way down. I think we crossed the same river, shallow a little river, but five or six times on the way to the bottom. I couldn't believe there's anything down there. I mean, a, a village. And when we get to the bottom, there it was. It's probably, you know, two, three hundred people lived down there. And they, too, had been devastated by the earthquake. So you, you know, when, you, when you get to a place where, where the devastation had occurred, basically, you, you just found, uh, you know, they would just use anything. Some of them just made little shacks out of cardboard boxes. Other people, others, you know, they literally would take sticks, you know, and tie them together and try to find some tarp or something to put over the top. So it was just this, you know, chaotic mess. And we set up our... our um, we had the truck that we had driven down with supplies and we, we set up, we started building these little buildings and preaching. And this was the first time that for several days, no one was giving their heart to the Lord. No one was getting saved. And I just, we all, we talked about it. We thought, what, what's the deal here? I didn't know much about spiritual warfare then. Didn't, didn't really wasn't really thinking about there could be a, a ruling spirit over that village or something like that. 
I just we just sort of assumed. I mean, man, this was back in the early '70s, back when I was two. <laughs> so I'm still only about 60, 55 or 50 or something like that. <clears throat> but we just I just assume you know we we must we we must just need a good idea. You know, we must there must be a different way we need to present this to this village. Or maybe just the right sermon hasn't been preached yet. You know what I'm saying? It's that <clears throat> And I wasn't the leader. I was one of the leaders, but not the leader. So the last day, the leader came to me and said, I want you to preach tonight. I said, okay, I was a little intimidated. I wasn't doing a lot of preaching at the time. I, was, I wasn't experienced at it and, and, and even less experienced at evangelistic type meetings. And I was intimidated because we had seen no fruit. So, the Lord reminded me before the meeting that night of something he had said to me before I left for this trip. He said it a certain way to get my attention. He said, I want you to be as Jesus to the people on this trip. And I thought, is that a heresy? Is that really God or am I hearing demons or what? You be as Jesus to the people. And then after he had my attention, he explained it. He said, I want you to be, you must be my hands, my feet, my mouth. And then he said something to me that just, I don't know if I was ready for, for I, don't, I, I, I don't know if you ever get ready for some of these things. He said, whatever comes up on this trip, whatever you experience, I want you to do what you know I would do if I was there in the flesh. I said, okay. I'm struggling with it right now. Wherever you, whatever you find, do what he would do. So he brought that back to me that afternoon. And before the service, they came, some of the team came to me and they said, well, we're on the far edge of this village. We were building one of these little huts today. And for this family in their little plot, kind of backyard, tied to a tree was a little girl about four or five years old. Six lived lived in the backyard, tied up like a dog. A bowl of water, filthy, nasty. And they said, "What?" You know, got the interpreter said, "What?" what What's the deal? Why are you doing this? And they were told she's crazy. She's crazy. Local. We don't know what to do for her. If we, take, if, we, if we don't tie her up, she runs off into the mountain. Disappears. We have to go find her. And we know she's going to die out there, so we don't know what to do. So we just... And they didn't have... <laughs> 
cars. They didn't have ability to get her any place for help or care. We just tie her up, take her out some food and water, and give her a blanket. <clears throat> There's a lot of crazy stuff in the world. So I didn't know what to do with that. I just thought, I don't know what to do with that. And that night I got in the, in the service. All the building was done and we were doing our service thing again. We had a little table set up in generator and it came time for me to preach and I jumped up on the table and the interpreter was standing next to me. And I just started into this message. I have no idea what I said or what I was saying. And I heard Holy Spirit say, I want you to tell them that you're going to pray right now for that little girl over there. And I'm going to set her free. And then they'll know. Tell them that. Then you'll know that what we've been saying to you is true. And you can believe. It's one thing to have a conversation like that with God off in, by yourself somewhere. It's another thing when you're up speaking and that conversation begins. And you're trying to think and you're trying to go through an interpreter and do it this way and you don't even really know much what you're saying this way because the real conversation is right back here somewhere, right about here. In the back of your mind. And I... I just honestly, just in my heart, in my mind, I'm having this conversation with God and I just thought, Lord, I just, Lord, you know, I mean, I pray for headaches. Yeah. Not demoniacs, <laughs> gathering demo people that run around crazy in the mountains and have to be tied up in the backyard. I th I, I, that's a little bit above my pay grade, Gina. And I just thought, I don't know if I'm going to do that. What? It would have been one thing. I wouldn't have struggled nearly as much if I had heard him say, pray for that girl. But when he said, <clears throat> and tell them I'm going to do this, and then they will know. Now, if that doesn't happen and I'm wrong and I'm not really hearing right, this is the final straw of the nobody getting saved this week in this village going to hell. So <clears throat> it wouldn't, didn't take a lot, of, wouldn't have taken, didn't take a lot of boldness for me to pray for her. The issue was announcing it's going to happen and this can be your proof that what we're saying is true. Because if it doesn't happen, it proves we're not, it's not true. So I had this little conversation in the back of my mind for while I was trying to talk. And I finally just decided, well, nobody's getting saved anyway. I don't have a lot to lose, you know. But what put me over the top was when he said, I need for you to be as Jesus to these people. And I need for you to do what you know he would do if he was here right now in the flesh. So I did. I told him what I heard. I said, we're going to pray for this little girl. You know, you all know this, you know, you know I'm talking about a little girl tied up, oh, and all the heads are, you know. We're going to pray for her. Jesus is going to set her free. This is demonic. Eyeball, nothing but eyeballs on that dark night in that village, just like. <laughs> okay, we're, we're all ears, we're watching. Yeah. I have no idea. 
idea what I said. Prayed a pretty simple prayer. She wasn't even there. She was across the village. But Jesus set her free. And the village came to Christ. He proved himself to those people. They were bad people. They were sinners. Jesus doesn't hate sinners. He expects sinners to sin. Some are better than others. They were bad people. They just didn't know if what we were saying was true. I think we're coming into a season where God's going to He's going to motivate, speak to, nudge some of you to say to a friend, I want to pray for you. I believe God wants to prove himself to you. 